Abena, this is an education for me. I know her, but I do not know how much accomplished she has been. She has this been. Year. 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 So it's a streaming thing with um, another platform that has joined us on custom life screening. So I began to follow her and I began to read her books and I've been very impressed. I usually moderate this program uh, and for most time, I do not ask questions unless as follow up. The way we are going to proceed is to start with Professor Bayi Shoyinka, uh, who is very well known uh, in the academy, extremely well known, a distinguished political scientist and a major figure. She recently gave an idea which have turned into a chapter, which she called narrative politics, in which she mentioned how narrative politics is embedded in all kinds of ideologies uh, and um, interpretations. Uh, she will start and will benefit very much from, from her questions. She teaches that um, uh, Itaka College, New York, and she's written books on African politics and has been a very prominent figure in the African diaspora. Professor Shwenka Rewele, please start this conversation. Thank you so much, Prof. And uh, thank you, Erelu, Your Excellency. It is such an honor to speak with you today. You have actually come to symbolize for millions of women and men uh, the incredible power, I think, of fusing activism, uh, theory, and actionable policy that literally transforms uh, laws, norms, and women's lives at a very personal and a collective level. So thank you for your courage. Thank you for your boldness. Thank you for your voice, your passion, and your wisdom. So why don't we start with this troublesome, uh, taboo word, feminism. You boldly use this language of feminism at a time when most African women in political leadership uh, hesitate to do so or reject the word altogether because of its often controversial meanings. In your work, you constantly reference feminist theory, uh, the feminist movement, and you speak about patriarchal domination and oppression. You might be the first first lady Nigerians have known to ever boldly speak on in these terms, uh, rather than the usual better life, you know, for rural women, uh, gender inclusion, and so on. But I also hear echoes of your strong grandmothers, your cultural values in your work. So your feminist identity is very complex very nuanced. Can you tell us some more about how and why you came to self-identify as a feminist and if it has put you at odds with some sectors of the women's movement? Thank you very much, Prof. It's really great to be here. But before I respond to your question, I would like to thank Professor Toyin Falola, my old teacher and mentor. Thank you for giving me this space. Um, I'm honored. And thanks to all those who have agreed to ask me questions um, this evening. And Prof. Bayi, thank you for the long question, which has a number of other questions embedded within it. But I will start um, from my own definition of the problematic F word feminism. I believe feminism to be a global struggle against all forms of patriarchal oppression. And those of us who name ourselves as feminists, 
are concerned about how institutions that prop patriarchy up, political and political, economic, social, cultural, religious, technological, and so on, need to be interrogated. I see my role as a feminist as, a, first of all, understanding what I'm up against. As I need to understand what patri patriarchy means and how it affects the lives of women throughout their life cycle. And then another task I have as a feminist is to decide um, based on the particular context I'm dealing with or the platform I'm occupying, how I address these patriarchal institutions or whatever form of patriarchal oppression I'm trying to address. So whether it's to simply question um, or interrogate, whether it's to um, push for reforms or simply overhaul a system and seek for transformation. Either way, I consider naming extremely important as part of a feminist politics, because when we name ourselves as feminists, it means we understand the issues we are up against, and we are prepared to do what it takes to address these issues, as opposed to um, you know, making excuses or hiding under all kinds of euphemism. Oh, I'm a feminist, but, oh, I believe in women's rights, but, I believe in this, but. I'm very clear that I am a feminist because patriarchy is a problem, and we all need to address it, both male and female. Now, you asked the question as to whether I'm considered um, you know, too um, radical in um, some quarters or whether I've come up um, against, um, whether I've you know, run into issues with some sectors in the book then because my politics seems to be complex. Yes, it, it's been that way because I've been on a long journey a long journey as a development practitioner, as um, a theorist, a writer, a mobilizer, someone who has worked in nonprofits for most of her life, and um, someone who found herself in politics as a political spouse and a politician in her own right. And so I believe throughout all these, uh, throughout my journey, I have had to figure out, again, as I said, said earlier, how best to use the platform and the tools that's at my disposal to push the feminist agenda that is important to me. And so sometimes some people might find me a bit too radical. For example, if I'm going into communities talking about uh, changing age old norms like female gender mutilation or pushing against sexual and gender based violence, which a lot of people take for granted. It's been that way for a long time and it should continue that way. So there might be that, those. And then there might be some in uh, the feminist movement who might consider me to be too conservative or too suspicious for their liking by virtue of my proximity to the corridors of power. And I fully understand that because I must admit, I have held deep suspicions and mistrust for women who have occupied my position um, you know, in the past and it, uh, to a large extent, even uh, in the present. So I fully understand that, but as I said, it's a, been a journey for me and I've learned a lot and I continue to um, learn that the fact still remains, I'm a feminist, no ifs and no buts. Let me interject a little bit. Can this feminism be converted to, to politics? And I want to... Prof, you're muted. So I, I want to bring this conversation. Is it possible to transform this feminism to political activism? We, the interview that will follow this, is we are bringing Aisha, Osori, and some five women to talk in terms of women participation in politics. So I won't waste much of your time. But it's an anecdote. So I asked President Jonathan when he was in power, because we met at AU and UNESCO meetings. I said, can't we actually encourage women to run to become president? Hey, she said, he said, hey, we already have a candidate. I said, who is that? He said, this is me. <laughs> so that's what he told me. That's, that's the president. 
So, uh, which means some of this conversation. When was this? When Jonathan was in power at the UNESCO meeting. Oh. <laughs> so, so uh, that may mean that other people are also paying attention to what you are doing in very, very positive ways. And I was in Abuja to give a lecture at the University of Abuja. And somebody said, if you want to rape, do not go to Ekiti State. <laughs> in other words, it is the only state where you cannot rape a woman. So many of these conversations are also creeping to the public. That's just, you don't have to respond. Professor, please continue. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Prof. Actually, I think it's an excellent question because it brings to the fore something that uh, Irelu has been doing that's incredible. You've kind of been at the forefront of this movement to create a solidarity in women's mobilization. And that might be the bridge that Professor Falola is referring to between your activism and politics. You know, you work, you speak the language of scholars in the academic cloister but also of activists. And then you are the head of these rather elitist political leadership uh, of governor's wives, the forums. And then in a kitty state, you certainly have been shaping policies that are among the most progressive in the nation, building women's shelters, working with international NGOs, certainly would support your mobilization for political leadership. Tell us the strategies that you are using and the values to build this solidarity. It's quite incredible. Thank you, Prof. I think I would like to go back to how I have interpreted my understanding and engagement with feminist theory and practice over the years. I came of age at a time when there were very fierce debates uh, going on about, um, you know, the political naming around feminism, about the priorities that black women were uh, trying to raise around, um, you know, what you know was supposed to be the core agenda of the feminist movement, which at the time was, um, you know, made, uh, dominated mainly by um, white Western voices. And then we had um, African feminists also trying to look at how all these um, definitions affected their own understanding of feminism in their communities. And from there, a number of features of African feminism started to emerge, and they resonated with me. First of all, African feminists, we consider a long history with slavery and colonialism and um, globalization and uh, neoliberalism and so on as an integral part of the way we engage with the term. We cannot engage with feminist politics without an understanding of how all these historical reality affect our community. And then again, as African feminists, we've also been very keen to place the issue of negotiating a new identity on the table. Yes, we are proud to be Africans. Yes, we are proud of our history and our cultural values, but we are not going to be part of cultures or traditions that minimize us, that dehumanize us. We want to be able to articulate an identity as African women that affirms our personhood, that affirms our right to dignity and respect. And then there's also been the question of uh, narratives, our roles uh, in um, our communities that have been uh, slowly undermined under the uh, over the years arose in politics in the economy in religious and cultural institutions and so on and so considering the fact that i have as i said occupied different spaces what is always at the back of my mind is how do i make this particular space relevant to my again long journey as a feminist when i was a women's rights, women's rights activist in the women's um, movement. I still am, but when, for example, I was with Akinamama wa Africa, my main objective was to build, help build institutions um, and African women's leadership, both on the continent and in Europe. When I was with the African Women's Development Fund, my main objective was mobilizing resources that could be used to strengthen women's organizations and networks across the continent. So those are pretty clear. 
But now as a first lady of a state, how do I bring to bear all this experience and my political understanding of feminism to make it relevant to the space I'm in now, even if I'm going to start walking in uncharted territory. It's not usual, to, it's not that it's not happened before, it certainly has happened, but I admit it's not usual to see a first lady so um, engaged in policy advocacy, so involved in ensuring that legislations are passed or policies are made. But because I know that I occupy this space I'm in now, for a limited period of time, I'm always going to be a feminist till the day I die. I'm always going to advocate for the rights of women, but I'm only going to be a first lady for eight years. Well, I was one for four years, and then um, I was a minister's wife for, uh, for another four years, and then I came back to be first lady for another four years. It has a time limit. But within this time frame, how can I translate all these things that are important to me? which I know would benefit millions of women in my community beyond just you know, simple reforms or palliatives that you know, really don't mean anything and uh, in the long term might not be sustainable. So I believe, you know, as I said, it's still part of you know, um, my long journey and but I found it extremely interesting and I learn every day. Thank you so much. I, I just feel like stopping to say thank you again on behalf of, you know, the women who I know many have benefited so much from what you've done. I want to turn to a little bit of your writing, you know. Uh, you wrote a beautiful article, Irilu, about women throwing their wrappers around other women as a form of solidarity, of empathy and affirmation. It went viral, I have to tell you that such a powerful imagery. Now, some activists question whether we should go with that idea because they feel it places a burden on women to be the ones who are there for other women while the state neglects its responsibility. That's one issue. The other question is, how exactly should women respond when women in positions of power or authority uh, seem to abuse that office? or are indicted for corruption or for some failure. Uh, what does it mean for us to throw our wrappers around women when they are in those situations? Uh, and it's, it's very political and it's a real question in the women's movement. And we women often criticize ourselves too harshly when men would give themselves a pass. But what does it mean to throw wrappers around other women in that situation? Thank you, Prof. I think it's when I wrote that essay, Where is your rapper? It came out of remarks I made at a women's conference in Lagos. And shortly after, I wrote it up as one of my weekly posts for loud whispers. And as you said, it went viral. And I was quite surprised because something it resonated with a lot of people. It's basically about compassion, it's about kindness empathy, solidarity. And these are things we know about, but we take them for granted. I know that there was a time when I really needed people around me. I needed a true friend. And those who I had um, assumed were friends turned out just to be mere political acquaintances. And there were some who then did turn out to be true friends. And so everyone needs kindness. Everyone needs to be shown compassion. And I also believe that the more you give other people, the more you will receive. So it's, it's something you know, to me that's very basic, something that we've all been taught, I hope, right from when we are young. But in these days when everything seems so fast and everyone seems to have an opinion about everything and everyone is up in, in, in every other person's business, and um, thanks to social media, we, we virtually have no boundaries anymore. There's so much toxicity in the air, so much nastiness. I thought it would be a reminder that as women in particular, we need to be kind and show compassion. Now to the other question you raised around what it then means for us in the political context when we expect certain things uh, from our sisters who are in certain positions, and they let us down, should we then extend the wrapper 
to them. I think um, we've always been clear in the feminist movement that when we are talking about women in leadership positions, we are talking about women who will come in with the right kind of values. Women who will come in willing to do business unusual, not business as usual with the boys. We have that expectation. And sometimes those expectations are not met. Do we then need to descend on these sisters the same way in which um, you know, the male dominated um, you know, media descends on them and consumes them in a media frenzy? I believe people should be held accountable, male or female, but we need to be circumspect. And I'll give you an example, and I don't know if this is going to uh, you know, get me into trouble, but I couldn't help but wonder now, someone like the former uh, Minister for Petroleum, Diazani Madriki, she has been accused of a whole lot of things. There are many, um, you know, uh, charges against her, and hopefully one day she will face this charge. She will have her day in court. And during that time, I wonder what the obsession is with her private jewelry collection. We have not seen the diamond wristwatches or the cufflinks of all the men who have been accused of corruption or corrupt practices. But there is this obsession with the jury of this woman who has not stood trial yet. She is standing trial in the court of public opinion, but she has not been found guilty in the court of law yet. So that's interesting. The day she does and she's found guilty, then she becomes a bona fide criminal. And then, you know, we can address it then. But I just wonder, so, you know, why do we allow women to be uh, treated differently? But having said that, those who we entrust, to whom um, much is given, much is expected, those who we entrust with our votes, with certain responsibilities, we expect that they will not go there and muddy the waters or foul the air for those who are going to come after them. That we should be aware that there are double standards out there. And as women, we need to be extremely careful. The, really, the example you gave just now is really points me to your writing. You know, you give an example and it was so compelling. It's the way you write. It's very unique, very compelling, very powerful. And you found a style and a voice that is very personal but also very political. And I, I was reading in loud whispers um, about your childhood experience with a swimming instructor, for example. You broke the taboos that caution women in particular. Don't speak about it. Don't talk about those deep personal realities. And I've wondered how and when, why did you decide to steep your public work in this personal narrative and how has the culture of shame and secretiveness worked against women's rights and protections? How did you change and how did you find that voice? And um, what do you see about the taboos that continue to hold women captive? Thank you, um, Prof. Well, I, because I write on a weekly basis, I try to look at things that um uh, a discussion or a conversation at that point in time and if there isn't a conversation i'm interested in i then you know uh, pull something out of the air but the article you, you refer to is the busola moment and it is in where is your rapper uh, my latest book i think i for those of you who um have it and i wrote that article after having a conversation with some of my staff members there was this heated argument going on about why it took busola so long to come forward to talk about what had happened to her as a teenager and then i shared with them a, um, a story of something that happened to me when i was around 13 years old I told my parents, I was in Lagos with my parents, I told my parents I wanted to learn how to swim. So my father asked this young man who was like a big brother to us, he was always running errands for my parents. And he lived next door, we called him um, Bodalai. So my father 
uh, called him and then uh, told him to take me and my aunt to airport hotel in Kaja to just how to swim. And so we went with um, Borderline. We, as soon as we got in, not more than five minutes after we got into the swimming pool, he started to touch me inappropriately. And I asked him, what are you doing? And he said, in Yoruba, can't I play with you? And I said, no, stop it. And so the next day, he came round to take us um, you know, for the swimming lesson again. And I said, no, I'm not going. And so my first swimming lesson became my last. And my parents didn't ask me why I never went back to learn how to swim. They just, or maybe they asked and I said, um, you know, maybe I mumbled an answer that I wasn't interested anymore, but I did not tell my parents what had happened. And so I told the uh, young people uh, I was sharing this uh, story with, a lot of young girls, things happen to them and they're afraid to speak up because they're afraid that they'll be blamed. They are afraid that they're going to be stigmatized. They are afraid that they are not going to be believed. And I experience, as women who have been working in this area for a long time, tells us that eight or nine out of um, you know, every child, eight, eight or nine out of you know, every 10 children who report cases of abuse are telling the truth. So we need to give um, you know, children the benefits of doubt. We need to listen to them. And as for survivors of sexual and gender-based violence, we shouldn't be putting a time frame on when, when anyone would be comfortable to come forward to share her story. What we need to be doing is create an enabling environment where survivors can feel comfortable enough to come forward and say, this has happened to me. I need care, I need support, I need justice. I give you the opportunity to ask one more question, if you don't mind. But before you do, I want to recognize the eminent writers who have joined us. Neo Shundari joined at some point. Wale Okedino is still here. Professor Boss at the University of Lagos. The writer, Mabel, University of Abuja. Uh, the Siva, the poet. I've seen so many writers. Uh, which is very good in terms of carrying this conversation forward. And I want to use this opportunity to congratulate Tunde Kelani, who is joining us now, is here with us on the release of his new movie, Anila. Congratulations, sir. We look forward to, to watching it. Please, uh, one more question from you. So difficult, Prof, very difficult. <laughs> I won't sneak in my question about the entitlement mantra and asking uh, what would it take for women to make it costly for politicians to ignore them. I'm going to talk about something else that I just okay. I think is unique about your work and the blessing of having a first lady like you. My jaw literally dropped when I read your very candid thoughts on how technological advances sometimes work against us. You wrote about the growing popularity of um, for example, of technologically sophisticated sex toys. And, you know, it takes you, Irelu, <laughs> to point out how even these things and the private spaces can reinforce women's oppression by reducing them to passive landscape uh, for male desire. And so it got me thinking about the ways in which different uh, advances can actually lead to a rollback in women's progress and uh, voice. And one of the areas is that of education. Who would have thought that being an educated woman could be used as a way of oppressing women? I've heard of PhDs who pretend that they only have a first degree because men would say, um, I don't want a woman with a brain. You're gonna be proud and disrespectful. And we are suffering a plague in the diaspora and at home of abuse against women who are being beaten up or killed because supposedly they become proud and disrespectful because they have a degree. And I know you've been doing a lot of work in this area. Erelu, can you share some thoughts with us, ideas, things in the pipeline? How do we prevent advances from being weaponized against women 
for example, how do we help uh, support young women who are educated and are being forced to hide their education because it's been used against them? Any thoughts or ideas would be appreciated. And thank you so much. Thank you, um, Prof. So if you remember what I was saying earlier about um, African feminists always talking about um, creating new identities, identities that are feminine and that recognize our personhood. We also observe that uh, African men are keen to move with the times, to uh, um, have the best education money can buy, to um, you know, build great houses and you know, drive nice cars, wear great clothes. But as far as women are concerned, we are best left behind in the 19th century. And so to have a society that expects that women are only good um, as um, wives and mothers and housekeepers, and even if they're going to venture into the public space, it's on sufferance. It's uh, for them to do things that are not threatening in any way. Just go and be a nice good teacher and, you know, just be a nurse and, you know, just you know, do something that does not threaten a man in any way. Well, I believe um, we need to be saying to everyone, regardless of the age we are, regardless of where we are located, that we cannot have societies that are built around the popping up of the ego and self-esteem of one gender. Women have a right to an education, to decent training and promotion opportunities, to earn a great, um, you know, to earn good money, and to be able to reap the fruits of their labor. Young girls are entitled to confidence and self-esteem and not to have it pressed out of them by uh, their parents or by teachers or their peers or boyfriends or eventually husbands. We cannot continue to see smart, articulate, educated women who are supposed to have the sky as their limit rendered a shadow of themselves simply because they have to fit themselves into a tiny box. And because we haven't been paying attention to this, we have um, been colluding more or less in the femicide of so many women at home and abroad. It is okay for women to dream of being in love. It's okay to fall in love and to get married. But women don't have to be married to monsters. It's a great thing to be in love. It's a great thing to be in a loving relationship. This is the time when I think I should give a shout out to my darling husband. He's on, um, he's on the Zoom. So, um, you know, thank you very much, darling, for being a, an absolutely wonderful man. There's still some great men like him. Unfortunately, they might not be the majority, if you be told, from all the things we hear. But there's nothing wrong in being in love and there's nothing wrong in wanting to have an intimate partner relationship. What is wrong is making women feel that they have to be less simply because a man needs to be more. So we need to have a different socialization process. We need to socialize our girls into believing that they can dream and their dreams can come true. And we need to socialize our boys into, be, into a different understanding of masculinity. You can be strong, you can be a man, you can, you know, you know, be anything you want to be. It does not have to be at the expense of the dignity of a woman. Thank, thank you very much. You could see uh, yeah, the professor of political science all clapping for your answers. Um, and I hope I to package the answers and share it with every young person yes, and every and, adult. And, and I'm sure those moments of of um, our clapping represent significant quotes. Professor Sati, the Dean of Social Sciences and Art University of Joss, thank very much for joining us. We appreciate you. Uh, we have the Dean of Social Sciences, Bangkok University, Professor Aliso, thank you for joining us. We have our mama, Mrs. 
Aulawa Dosumu, thanks for joining us. Professor Rasmussen, thanks for joining us from the US. Uh, if I don't mention your name, please forgive me. I deliberately do not want to mention His Excellency so that his participation will not term um, dent the, these great contributions. Uh, but thanks for mentioning him. Um, and we want to congratulate Professor Pamela Smith, who joined us from Nebraska. She, 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 she's very famous. She translated Akinwu Misholas' plays, and she's just translated his play, Shawuro Ide. We thank you for joining us. And she won last week an award on translation. Thank you very much for joining us. And Professor Vickers, who taught at IFE when you were there, she was teaching political science and international relations. Thank you for joining us from the United Kingdom. Uh, I want to move to, but, but before I do so, I have a suggestion that um, um, Professor Shoenga can respond to, and the Excellency can respond to. Going through your books, I be, it occurred to me, why can't we take the nuggets into pocket books? Bear in mind that many of our people don't have the luxury of long books. Uh, as I was reading them, I began to say, can we not just convert this paragraph into a pocket book? And as I like, for instance, the moment when she was clapping for you, representing great quotes, our people can read pocket books, especially high school universities. And this should be a project you can consider uh, in which when you have, somebody has been writing long books, somebody will now say, okay, let me create pocket books out of them. Mm. What will you, uh, great professor of political science, what do you think about that? Prof, I think it's a phenomenal idea. As many years ago when I was in South Africa, I recall seeing that they converted their constitution into a pocketbook because they wanted every person to know their rights, to understand it in a language they could understand. It was no bigger than this. And I'm on the Human Rights Commission here in Tompkins County. I would love, love to see some of these great you know, words and you know, shortened uh, excerpts from your work. We would happily convert that and share it with our young people. I, I think it's a phenomenal idea. And I think many organizations would actually support that. They you know, help to fund it and to distribute those pocket books. I would love that. Yeah. Yes, I'd love that. Thank you, bro. Yeah. Yeah. And they can be illustrated as well. Now, if mm -hmm. you've created a large body of work like this, one other idea is instead of teaching in generalized gender format, in generalized women's studies format. Can't we teach one person? Can't say, and I won't use the University of Ekiti because in Nigeria, everything becomes politicized. Can't we say Babcock, Ogun State University? We're not asking you not to mount your general women's studies courses, but if one person has accumulated a body of books, like this extensive books, can't we focus on teaching just that person and then look and then using those ideas to match in our life terms and to bring out these specificities? I'm asking you. Oh, wow. I, I, you're asking me, Prof. No, really? I'm ask, I'm you're asking, asking Prof. Shenka. Yes. Oh, I, I think it's, I don't think we've done enough of actually doing that in African context. For some reason, we have failed to really um, allow students to really go deep into the works consistently of an individual. I'm not sure why we've acquired that wrong approach to academia, which the West consistently uses. They, we do Shakespeare and students go deep into their works and begin to understand what has been you know, said and the values and the systems and issues. I think it would be amazing and I, reading all your works and the fact that you bring a different form of narrative, a different form of politics, a different approach to feminist thinking, 
that could really liberate how women feel about sharing their experiences and is rooted in our cultural and uh, social context, I think we could also do that. So Prof. Alola is throwing out some really exciting ideas here and I'm setting you up for running towards it. So I'm going to do a section on you in my human rights class actually coming up in the fall. And hopefully we can oh. then use that in this fall, yes. So get ready to have an invitation. We'll do a, a major section in doing gender and then share with our colleagues, perhaps in Nigeria and elsewhere, about how we can move from a section to a major course that allows people to really engage you know, the life, the struggles and the questions. I think it's a fabulous, fabulous idea that's easily actionable. Thank you. So we are having yes, and I'm really excited about that possibility. Yes. Yes. I have um, a relationship, of course, with the Center for Gender Studies at Ikit State University and the Center for Gender and Social Policy Studies at um, OAU. So and then, of course, King's College London. So I'll you know, certainly be looking forward to that opportunity. It's a great one. Thank you. I'm honored. And I'll be glad to be part of developing the syllabus. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We now want to move to the great writer, columnist. The mem she serves on the member of the board of um, Premium Times, Bamendele Ademola Olateju. I, I am addicted to her writings. I think I've read a lot about her and I've promised myself I will do an essay on her. She's an author, digital strategist, a great humanist, uh, someone who has tremendous passion for the development of Nigeria. And she's written on women issues, children issues. One of our recent pieces that I love tremendously, cautioning us, how do we treat our elderly? Thinking that we can hand them over to some caretakers. Well, let me use this occasion to celebrate uh, Bamindele, to celebrate a commitment. And please, uh, I give you 30 minutes to ask your questions. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Prof. Thank you for the opportunity of this platform. And thank you, Professor Okpeyi, for those great questions. You have set a great tone for this interview. Um, I want to thank Erelu for being on this platform to answer our questions. Your Excellency, I consider anger as a legitimate response to the oppression of women who have been subjected for millennia. These days, especially on social media and elsewhere, the angry feminist isn't just a trope. In Nigeria, there are many feminists that are very, very angry. What do you think is the basis of this anger? Young feminists in Nigeria seem to hate anything and everything about men. Do you think feminism is linked to misandry? Um, okay, thank you very much, uh, my dear sister Bamidele, who I fondly call the Amotekes, but that's another conversation. I'm going to um, try and answer uh, the questions because I have two questions in one. I'll, I'll um, answer the first part about um, the anger that young women feel these days, and then we'll uh, I'll have a conversation about misandry. Now, I believe it is not just young women who are angry these days. Young women are angry, and older women are angry probably for different reasons. As an older feminist, I am angry that after all the years of working on these issues, the patriarchal norms and values that we are trying to address remain impervious to change. And even when we make gains, patriarchy has a way of remolding itself and restructuring and reorganizing and then you solve one problem and then you have to start addressing another one. So I'm angry. And then we have the younger feminists who believe that they are expected to accept the same disrespect, the same poor treatment, 
the same, um, basically the same kinds of shenanigans that their mothers and grandmothers were forced to endure. It, it, so it's now assumed that they too would just step in at nice young girls and um, you know, it would, um, life would continue that way. And young feminists these days are saying, no, we are not our mothers, we are not our grandmothers. And we need to listen to them. And we should start forcing certain concepts around the way we lived, around the values that we grew up with, down their throats. Granted, of course, we have a lot of positive values that we grew up with that we are going to be passing on to our children, absolutely. But there are some things that were really not great about some of the ways in which women were treated in our society that we should stop romanticizing. I mean, you shouldn't expect that our daughters to put up with the same thing. And I actually think anger is a good thing. I'm talking about um, you know, positive anger now, not the kind of negative anger that will make you want to go out and shoot someone. Anger wakes you up in the morning. Anger gives me a fire in my belly, wanting me to go out and challenge things and do things. I believe someone who isn't angry or walked up or feeling passionate about something. There is not the kind of change agent um, you know, that can get much done. And so I'm all for anger. I just um, you know, want the anger of old and young feminists to stay focused on ensuring that we do whatever we can to bring about workable solutions in our communities. Now, on the issue of misandry, um, the fact that a lot of young women just simply hate men and don't want to talk about men. Now, that's where we need to be careful because a misandrist is not a feminist, not necessarily. And a feminist is not necessarily a misandrist. Now, as I said earlier, if as a feminist, I believe in the personhood of women. I believe in the right of women um, to be able to live their lives without thinking they have to fit into a box, regardless of what patriarchal um, you know, restrictions say. Now, for those who believe that um, individual men are their problem, they are not going to get much done. A misandrist, for example, is someone who hates men, who hates individual men. Now, while we as feminists understand that individual men are the beneficiaries of um, patriarchal powers and privileges, it is the institutions that drive this that we are concerned about. We are not concerned about going after individual men because it makes no sense. These individual men happen to be our fathers, our brothers, our husbands, our lovers, our sons, our brothers, and so on. And so while feminism has an agenda around addressing patriarchal power and privilege and dismantling patriarchal institutions, or at least transforming them, if we can dismantle them, misandry does not serve any political agenda as opposed to just, you know, um, you know being a way of blowing off steam. Oh, I hate these guys. If it's the same thing as saying, I, um, I don't like Doya so so and so because he's a lousy prosecutor or he's a lousy, um, you know, um, he's a lousy lawyer to have. So that to then translate into, I hate um, the entire legal profession. So, or because uh, this uh, architect came to design my house and he did a lousy job, therefore architecture should be scrapped from institutions. Nobody should learn how to become an architect. So we shouldn't conflate uh, the two. Uh, misandries should try and channel their energy into things that are productive and can get things done so that as feminists, we can do the things that are required of us. Don't waste our time chasing after individual men. It does not make sense. Um, thank you. Before she asks her second question, let me recognize Her Excellency, Ghana's ambassador, to Brazil, Professor Abena Busia. She's joined us here. I mentioned her name to open this program. Uh, when you are ready, can we, can we see your face, Professor Busia, so that we can formally greet you. And there are great political scientists uh, among us, uh, Professor Richard Joseph, very well known in Nigeria, I'm Professor Akimboye from the University of Lagos. 
Thank you for joining us. So these great ideas we've just expressed, will it be possible as one, as one of the outcomes of this interview, that where we have consensus, can we not push those consensus to civic education in schools, on our campuses? There are some issues where consensus have not been generated. But your, your last answer is suggestive that there's a body of consensus. Is there not a way to say this body of consensus must be part of, must be part of the education system? that must be formalized in schools. Th thank you, Prof. Um, we need to uh, note that what I'm sharing here is my personal opinion. There are some issues on which there is consensus, and I'll be sharing those um, hopefully as we go along, um, you know, as more questions um, come. But this particular question around feminism and misandry is an issue that's been out there for a while. There are quite a number of feminists who share my views. And there are some, maybe the younger ones, who will not. And that's absolutely OK. As I said earlier, I've been on a journey. And this is where I am at this stage of my life and on my journey. And I have discovered that there's a difference between addressing institutions, addressing um, your norms and values, and chasing after individual men who, by the way, depending on what we are talking about, could also be victims of the same uh, patriarchal norms uh, and values that we are trying to uh, fight against. So it's a nuanced conversation. People will come to it uh, based on their experience and where they are at any given point in time. Thank you. Please, your next question. Thank you. Erelu, I would like to talk about keeping girls in school. When you champion, I'm like, why haven't anyone talked about this before? You left to critique the disruption of girls' education due to pregnancy. By doing so, you reframed and articulated the right of girls to continuing post basic education regardless of pregnancy. What that means to the girl, to a future woman, is that you have succeeded in setting education as a right and not a privilege that is subject to withdrawal or punishment. That is a first. What informed that decision? OK, now, so now you see what happens with an angry, middle-aged feminist. <laughs> In 1995, I went to the Beijing conference. And as we were preparing for the Beijing conference at the Africa Regional Preparatory Conference for Beijing in Dakar in 1994, it was African feminists and African governments who placed the issue of the girl child on the Beijing platform for action. It was not there. By that time, uh, the, the United Nations had already decided on 11 critical areas of concern. But African feminists insisted that they needed to address the issue of the girl child. That was the time when many African countries were either in the midst of violent conflict or just emerging from violent conflict. And the education of millions of girls across the continent have been disrupted. And um, country after country kept bringing forward very dismal figures about the enrollment of girls in their schools. And so that's how the girl child got onto the agenda of the Beijing platform for action. And a lot of progress has been made over the past 26 years, I must admit that. Even to the point that in many parts of Southern Nigeria, for example, the enrollment of girls in schools outnumbers that of boys. In most parts of Northern Nigeria, the education of um, girls is still a big problem because of the um, insurgencies um, there and the uh, cultural um, restrictions as well. But in many parts of Southern Nigeria, we have basically moved the agenda forward in terms of being able to make a case for girls to go to school. But guess what? In the year 2021, we are finding it difficult to keep our girls in school. 
our girls keep dropping out of school either because they are poor, even where education is free, there are other things that need to be paid for, school uniforms, shoes, meals, and so on. If their families are poor and they have to make a choice between whether it's the girl who gets to go or the boy who gets to go, the girl stays at home hawking oranges or bread. As she's hawking oranges or bread, that's where she falls into the hands of some sexual predator. She gets pregnant and that's the end of her life. She loses it. And on and on. And so I found myself in the first stage of the state. Uh, sometimes I go around the maternal health centers to encourage women to register when they are pregnant with the primary health care facilities. And I hand out uh, maternal um, health kits um, to, to encourage them. And I find myself handing out kits to 15 year old, 16 year old, 17 year olds, pregnant. Girls are supposed to be in school. And so that's why we say we need to do whatever we can to keep our girls in school. So if they get, and they don't get pregnant by themselves, someone makes them pregnant. And in Ekiti State, because we have the child rights law and we have the violence against persons prohibition law and the um, compulsory treatment and care for sexually abused minors law, anyone who has sexual intercourse with anyone below the age of 18 in Ekiti State commit statutory rape. There's no such thing as consensual sex with a minor. So therefore, if any of our girls get pregnant, they have the choice of staying on in school till they deliver their babies, or they can go away and have their babies and they can still come back to school. There will be no um, you know, stigma or shame attached to that. There'll be no repercussions. They won't be expelled from school simply because they got pregnant. And that way we will be able to ensure that we keep as many of our girls in the system as we can. There are other barriers to the, to the education of girls. And there's, uh, as I said, there's the issue of poverty, there's sexual exploitation, even things as basic as access to menstrual hygiene products. We found out that many of our girls in poor remote areas stay at home at a particular time of the month because they can't afford sanitary protection. And so with these legislations and policies in the Kitty State, we are trying to make sure that we keep as many of our girls as possible in school so that years down the line, the boys who they were in class with are not the ones who become the engineers, doctors, lawyers, and senators. And the girls they went to school with are the ones who are selling um, plantains and bread at the roadside, which is where we are headed if we don't um, you know, um, address all these issues very seriously. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, in after the 2019 elections, you wrote, you wrote an article, The Need for Atilan. That article is a rich repertoire of political wisdom. One of the profound nuggets of wisdom therein that I gleaned was you said there is something about political contest that encourages inoculation against immodesty and restraint. I love reading it and it still makes me laugh now because in that uh, you mentioned uh, people who thought they were lions, they were actually kittens. <laughs> so you wrote that I have also learned that black and white are luxuries only the delusional can afford, although I struggle with how much gray I'm comfortable with. How, can you explain what gray can mean in politics in your experience? Now I'm convinced that you want to get me into trouble. Uh, well, I believe that in politics, um, you know, black and white is very difficult. We mostly deal with shades of gray. And yes, there are, um, you know, there are some shades of gray uh, that bother me, but you know, it's what it is. And two plus two is hardly ever four in politics. Um, and there's, it's, it's supposed to be, mathematics is supposed to be logical. Two plus two equals four, but not in politics. So I believe uh, those gray areas for me include um, the lack um, of opportunities for a lot of people in politics, a lot of, um, for women, for young people, and even for men who have ideas that might sound uh, too revolutionary or progressive, for the conservatives who uh, mostly dominate the political space. So it's very difficult to navigate the space without the aid of a godfather 
You can't um, engage in politics without the support of the Godfather. And um, I've also learned that if we can't do without Godfathers, why don't we have Godmothers? And I've tried my hand, and I must confess, successfully at being a Godmother. Because if men have Godfathers to get from one point to the other, why should uh, women be the ones, um, you know, standing as observers in the political process? And women are the ones who fuel political machinery. So I too have, you know, you know, tried my hand at being a godmother every now and then. And uh, Professor Kweyi will remember um, a debate that uh, took place on one of our feminist platforms when uh, some people were saying, um, you know, why do you have to? Why does anyone have to kneel down for any? a male leader for any godfather that that's absolute nonsense and so the debate went on and on and i chipped in and i said me this is me i have knelt down for political leaders asking for favors please sir consider us sir. we need to do this we need to do that because that's what it takes in political settings and i also noted that there are a lot of people who are old enough to be my father or my mother who prostrate or kneel for me as well. And it's uh, my big sister, Professor Runke Oyewumi, I don't know if she's on this Zoom, who wrote about this in uh, some of her analysis of um, age, status, gender, and power amongst the Yoruba. It's, it's um, rather complex and nuanced. And these are some of the things that um, these are some of the tools I have taken into the political space that I engage with. So yes, um, the need for godfathers um, and um, sorry, the existence of godfathers and therefore the need for more women to set up, step up to support other women. We're providing them with the kind of political capital that is required, the opportunities, the financial support and so on. And then, of course, there's a role that money plays in politics. Unfortunately, with each electoral cycle, the um, you know the cost of running for election keeps going up, and that's very worrisome. And um, it's one thing for us to uh, sit on the sidelines and complain about the cost of running for elections, and as we are making those very uh, serious arguments, the costs are not going down; they keep going up. So, what do we do about it? And then um, the issue, of course, of um, what has been famously termed as stomach infrastructure, which um, people believe is essential in terms of being able to get support from grassroots communities. On the one hand, we cannot continue to um, allow our people to believe that the only way they can engage with politicians or in the political process is if there's something that directly benefits them on the spot through a Congo of rice, a bag of gari, or a wrapper, and so on. But at the same time, we still need to find ways of engaging with those who make up the numbers when we ask people to come out to vote. A lot of us um, have great ideas on social media, but our arguments and debates on social media do not translate into votes on election day. And so those are still some of the gaps that need to be filled. But I believe that every single one of us has a role to um, play in the political process. And we need to learn from one electoral cycle to another. But sadly, we don't seem to be doing enough of that. I will give um, Thank you. Uh, our sister Bamindele one more question in the interest of time. Uh, there are two vice chancellors here in the audience, one from Uganda, um, Professor Amidu Soni, vice chancellor of Fante University. Thanks for joining us. And we have great journalists here from nations, we have uh, Oye Bile, and we have um, the great man who writes for Premium Times all the time, Chido Onuma. Thanks for joining us. The quality of our audience is so high. Uh, each time we meet is a form <coughs> intellectual community, and we thank all of you. Please, one more, because the audience, if we don't involve them, they're going to get angry. <laughs> So please, can you ask one more question, please? Okay, sir. Let's go to popular culture, Irinu. You are a woman of many parts, so in tune with popular culture because I read uh, what you wrote about Jerusalem long before anybody heard about it, before it became a hit. 
And the Game of Thrones, you know what young people are up to each time. You catch up on TV series, on sitcoms, on songs. In one of your articles in uh, Above Whispers, you wrote about the Game of Thrones. Well, you made me go back because I never watch all those things. I don't really have the time. So I, I read about it and I learned a lot of leadership lessons from the two episodes I've watched so far. I have a question from the first episode based on what I have gleaned from your own leadership style. Queen Lannister tells Ned Stark, when you play the game of thrones, you win or you die. There's no middle ground. Is the thing wrong, Irelu? Is there a middle ground in leadership, in politics, as illustrated by the game of thrones? Okay. Um, so I hope there are a number of Game of Thrones fans um, in the audience who would understand, um, you know, what this is. But somebody like Queen Cersei Lannister saying a thing like that, um, you know, you either, um, you know, win um, or you lose. People like Cersei are the kinds of leaders who have brought countries to ruin. Those are the kinds of leaders who will do anything to acquire power and to hold on to power. They are the kind of people who shut the door on anyone who comes with ideas of doing things differently to transform things and uh, you know, enable societies to grow and develop. So for Queen Cecil Lannister, power is all about serving themselves. It's all about control. It's all, it's all about domination. Ned Stark, on the other hand, of House Stark, is, is, he epitomizes the leader who believes in service, service to the people, um, you know, transformation whether it's of institutions or of structures or of ways of doing things, integrity, accountability, nobility in every sense of the word, and core values of love, compassion, kindness, the kinds of things that enable human beings to fulfill their full potential. So I believe that our challenge is to try and move people from that understanding that people like Cersei Lannister have about what leadership is or the kind of leadership that our communities throw up. We need to move our thinking from that to Ned Stark's ideal. Unfortunately, Ned, Ned Stark's ideas for that time were so unwelcome that he literally lost his head because of it. So there's a price to be, there's a price to be paid for being an outlier, for um, having revolutionary ideas, for wanting to be different and for wanting to do the right thing for the right reasons. And so we need to get ourselves to that point where our politics are like that, where you know, we can say our leaders are servants of the people, our leaders are compassionate, they are kind, they will listen and they'll do the best they can to ensure that everyone has opportunities. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And listening to this segment in relation to the previous, yet another idea occurred to me. The rapper essay, which I also read, which I enjoyed, and with Tune Kilani here, I think given the kind of audience we have in our country, I think that there are some in your pieces that are convertible into shorter films and documentaries. And it occurred to me, Tundi Kilani we talk all the time. I will send some pieces to him and say, look, which ones can we convert into, into shorter documentaries and films that we can put on WhatsApp and circulate? Because these are great ideas, but we can't, we just have to release all these ideas to the greater public for consumption. 
In other words, an attempt to create a bigger movement for ideas that can transform our country. Thank you so much. Uh, so it's my privilege to invite um, Shagunwadeni, the prominent um, journalist and writer. We went to the same school with Terelu Atife uh, before she, he moved to the University of Lagos for his master's and he received a certificate of fellows at Harvard University. I've been reading, I've, I don't think any, he has written a book that I've not read. Uh, and he's very famous as the chairman of this the editorial board uh, and his work with Concord, uh, with Guardian, and um, his current book with some little bit of controversy, Naked Abuse, Sex for Greats in African Universities, which was released um, last year. And at the airport uh, some 10 years ago, you always find um, his famous book on Yaradua, uh, I think Power, Politics and Death, uh, which became so famous. Thanks for accepting uh, to interview Our Excellency, and we look forward to your great questions, please. Kindly begin. Yeah, thank, thank you, Prof, for inviting me. And now we are moving from uh, matriarchy to patriarchy. Good <laughs> evening, Erelu. Good evening, my dear brother. Yes, thank you very much. And let me just follow up on the issues already raised by Prof and my sister, Bamidele. I mean, Prof talked about my book. You have uh, lately been involved in the advocacy to curb this uh, challenge of transactional sex between lecturers and students on the campuses of institutions of higher learning in Nigeria. Do you think the authorities in the education sector, do you think they are doing enough to deal with this problem? Thank you, my dear brother. With all due respect to our leaders in the education sector, I don't believe they are doing enough. And for those who have started to do something, a whole lot more needs to be done. In Ekiti State, uh, we have been going around and um, doing, uh, doing advocacy with tertiary institutions about you know, the things that need to be put in, in place to ensure that um, we can have um, all these issues minimized as much as possible in these institutions. And I'm pleased that my alma mater, Obafemi Awilowo University, um, is now um, you know, acting very firmly on all these issues by ensuring that there's a standing sexual harassment um, and offenses committee to engage with these issues. But I think all our tertiary institutions in the country, and not just the tertiary institutions, um, because this problem of um, you know, sexual harassment and sexual and gender-based violence, from the information that is coming to us, from all the evidence that we have, goes right down to primary schools. So we need our education institutions to be very alert. There needs to be zero tolerance for all forms of sexual harassment and gender-based violence. And the tone for this needs to be set by the leadership of the institutions. Every tertiary institution in the country needs to have a sexual harassment and gender-based violence policy. It should be mandatory. Right now, institutions are developing these um, you know, policies um, because they feel it's a good thing to do. It should be made my, mandatory, maybe by the Federal Minister of Education, the National Justice Commission, that it should be mandatory. Every institution should have uh, you know, a policy in place. And there, with that policy all, also needs to come a transparent um, and unambiguous grievance um, procedure so that when a case is, uh, has been reported or has been handled, we know exactly what steps are being taken. And we should have um, safe spaces and, and support systems in place in all these institutions so that when victims come forward, they can share their stories in an atmosphere of um, respect, trust, 
and um, you know, with minimum you know, shaming and blaming. And then we also need to um, address the issue of security in our schools as, as well. A lot of the cases that we are seeing around uh, sexual violence on campuses or in schools, for example, is linked to the lack of security. University authorities need to do better in terms of providing accommodation, particularly for female students. This practice of having female students live, all, live in very dubious apartments all over uh, town, is, it's not um, you know, desirable at all. It makes them vulnerable. And sometimes a lot of these girls are forced to share um, apartments or homes with boys who, um, you know, who they start out as flat based, then they become boyfriend, girlfriend, then acting husband and wife. And all this is not good for, um, you know, for all these young girls. And then we, we uh, this might sound, you know, a bit harsh, but one way to test that a system is in place and is working and delivering what it's supposed to is to have scapegoats. So we need as many scapegoats as possible so that people will sit up and they will know that the authorities mean business. As I said in the, um, you know, forward to your book, Shegun, that you kindly asked me uh, to write, we um, can, in this day and age, we can't be sending our girls to the university and, you know, have them start dodging the, um, you know, the, um, the groupings of their male lecturers. That's not acceptable. Even if it was in the past, we can't continue like that. This is a new day. And that is one of the reasons why young women are angry these days, and rightfully so. OK, see, talking about gender issues, I mean, I recently read a story, which I believe maybe you also read, of a woman who was a widow, who was compared to, 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 to uh, who was compared, who was being compared to take the water that had been used to burst the, the, the cups of our late husband. I mean, we are, and you have all these kind of cultures that are, that not only diminish women, but actually degrade them. I mean, how do you think we can, we can tackle some of these problems, norms that have been there over the, over decades and, and, and they still impede the progress of, of, of women in Nigeria? Thank you. Well, as I said earlier, when I was um, having my conversation with Prof, it's all about this issue of um, trying to create new identities for ourselves as African women, as Nigerian women. And what does this mean uh, in our communities? Does my being a good Nigerian woman hinge on the fact that I will subject myself um, to harmful traditional practices? That is the basis on which it should be, um, you know, I, I will be accepted as a good Nigerian woman. A woman has just lost her husband. She has not been allowed to mourn. Immediately in many communities, she's the first suspect, regardless of whether he died of natural causes or died in an accident, something that is clear for everyone to see. She's an immediate suspect. And so, so I think, um, and these are, and people tell you, but oh, that's how we've always done these things. They go way back and so on. And so the case that we are making is cultures and um, these traditions and so on, they evolve, they are not static, they change. And we don't see any reason why we can't have these conversations about big lives of dignity and respect. But because we can continue to have these conversations as theoretical, um, you know, um, concepts, we need to now start looking at very practical things that we can do um, as individuals and um, as institutions if we are part of relevant institutions. And one of them, uh, for instance, is for us to make a commitment, make a personal commitment that you are going to um, be socialized differently, you are going to socialize people around you differently. As I said earlier, our girls need to be socialized differently, and so do our boys so that our boys will not grow up to become that uh, man who beats his wife, or that girl doesn't grow up to be that sister-in-law or mother-in-law who will terrorize another woman. So we all need to make those personal commitments. We are all part of the community. Another thing is, again, the issue of legal and policy frameworks. Uh, communities need to be able to understand that there are some things 
that will not be acceptable in the eyes of the law. And if people do those things, they will be held liable. And in many states across Nigeria, we have legislation against harmful traditional practices, such as the maltreatment of widows and female genital mutilation. Some of us are trying to get a gender and equal opportunities bill passed through the National Assembly. And we are hoping that we'll be able to do that before the end of this year. Those kinds of legislations, by the way, we have that in Ekiti. We have a gender and equal opportunities law in Ekiti. Those kinds of legislations and policy frameworks would go a long way in protecting, providing some kind of protection for women. Then we also need, of course, to have intergenerational conversations. We have a lot of young men out there who do not agree with a lot of all these cultures and traditions. We have a lot of young women out there who we have heard are angry. But we need to have conversations with them about how to move these conversations forward so that they don't get counterproductive. Then in our communities, who are the custodians of these patriarchal norms and values? We have people who can be converted into champions. We have the traditional rulers, the religious leaders, the market women, and so on. We need to continue to engage with them so that they see themselves as change agents and as community champions. And then of course, if it's in terms of institutions, whether we are talking about political, uh, academic, or you know, all those institutions that can help help drive these processes forward, we need strong political will, because it is political will that can ensure that all these issues get addressed. And it's not something, of course, that can be done overnight. We've been doing it for a long time. But there is a framework for which how this can happen. And every single one of us, regardless of the space we occupy, we have a role to play. Well, we are fortunate that we have three vice chancellors with us here. And I would appeal to them so please, um, when the time is due to the audience to intervene, uh, Professor Batunde Edo of um, Glorious Vision at Ibuega University is here, and we'll be very, very happy if they also make their interventions. Please, um, Alaba, kindly continue. Okay, now, now that we are talking about politics, I mean, the majority of those who vote, not only in Nigeria, but across the world, are women. But even in instances where women are on the ballot, especially in Nigeria, voters largely ignore their aspiration. That's why we have never had a, a, not, even a, a, not, not even a single female governor in Nigeria. Why do you think the political arrangements in the country is skewed against women? And what are your prescriptions for addressing this problem? Thank you. Remember what I said earlier, in politics, two plus two is not four. One would have thought that yeah. with the significant number of women that we have um, in the voting populace, the number of women who have voters cards, and the number of um, very well-educated and engaged um, women in the political um, you know, circles, that we would uh, see more women in um, elected positions, we would at least have had a number of women voted in as governors, and we would not be dealing with a miserable 5%, less than 5% of women in the National Assembly. It all goes back to the notion of um, women being accepted as leaders in their community. That acceptance is now coming gradually. Things are a lot better than they were, uh, say, maybe 20 years ago. People are now beginning to acknowledge that women can lead, women can provide uh, you know, a sense of direction, but it, it is um, a journey that has been a slow and painful one. And there are many things that are stacked against women in, um, in, in you know, political races. We sometimes talk about these political races as if it's the same for men um, and women. In every political uh, cycle of race, the men are already midfield before, and women are still at the starting point. Men are already midfield. We don't have the same political capital that they have. We don't have the same, uh, we don't use social capital the same way. We don't have the same kinds of financial resources. And so we need to, and first of all, um, ensure that we continue to they claim to what should be due to women in the political uh, space. 
to continue to demand for women to have more than 5, 10, 20% in political representation. It's supposed to be a minimum of 35%. We need to keep pushing um, you know, for that recognition. But I'm also a fan of um, special me measures, or some people might call them drastic measures or uh, measures that might sound a bit um, unpopular um, or unsustainable. I believe that if at this point of our history in Nigeria, we are still dealing with the issue of uh, such poor representation of women in politics, it's time to now start talking about affirmative action and quotas, about special seats for women. And this is nothing new. This, these are things that have been done in other African countries, in South Africa, Namibia, in Kenya, Uganda. So if we are really serious in Nigeria about creating space for women in political leadership, we need to go beyond asking to be included um, you know, in this space or that space, um, you know, begging our party um, leaders, begging godfathers and so on. We need to address, we need to address this issue of um, affirmative action and quotas because we need something that is embedded in laws and policies and not just left at the discretion at the discretion of our political leaders, our party godfathers, or our governors. And every political season, I've done it, so it's something that's very personal to me. Every political season, we go begging, please, sir, remember, please, these women, they worked hard for us. They suffered during the campaigns. All the men have been rewarded. These women have not been included. We are tired of doing that. It should be a right for women in political spaces, for them also to be able to you know, be given opportunities and to lead and put um, you know, themselves forward. So I'm a big fan of these special measures. And I hope that in the new constitutional reform process, in the new electoral reforms that are happening right now, we'll be able to get these addressed, as well as the, through the gender and equal opportunities bill. Yeah, let, let, me, let me commend you for the efforts you played in equity, especially on the laws against rape. But I mean, when you look at the, the, the social problem, it's still a, a, a big challenge in Nigeria. Everywhere, I mean, it's, uh, there's hardly any day when there will be no reports about uh, rape of women and girls. I mean, it's become very prevalent now. How, how do we tackle this, uh, this, this challenge? How do, how do we begin to address this challenge in a more holistic manner? I mean, beyond what uh, uh, you and the Excellency are doing in Nikiti. How do we make that kind of intervention national? Well, I think the intervention is already national because if you recall, um, last year, the Nigerian Governors Forum declared a state of emergency on gender-based violence. And some of us governors wives got together and we said we need to do something about the rise in sexual and gender-based violence that we had all uh, witnessed during the COVID-19 lockdowns. And gender-based violence has always been an issue that we have grappled with, not just in Nigeria, all around the world. But it became exacerbated during the COVID-19 lockdowns for obvious reasons. Women and girls were trapped in their homes and in their communities with um, their tormentors. And so we felt as governor's wives, um, we sometimes some of us receive these um, and GBV survivors first before they are taken to the people bring them to us first because they feel that we'll get they'll get justice from us or that there will be something that will happen. So they bring them to us first before even taking them to the hospital or to the police. So some of us got together and we decided to uh, set up an initiative around gender based violence. And the first thing we did was to write to our husbands at the Nigerian Governors Forum, asking them to declare a state of emergency on gender-based violence, which they did on the 10th of June, 2020. And what that meant was that the state governors were going to go back and where laws don't exist on GBV, ensure that the laws are in place. And where laws are in place, ensure that implementation is done as effectively as possible. So in a Kitty state, we have had um, a gender-based violence management committee in place for a while, which is the implementing body for the GBV law. And from what we have learned in a Kitty, and these are lessons that have been shared um, across uh, the country, is that for us to have a robust GBV response, a number of things have to be in place. First of all, you need to be able to have very clear 
legal and policy frameworks. You have the laws and any additional laws or policies to back it up so that um, victims can move from being victims to survivors when they have access to justice. Second, you need to be able to have facilities in place for the treatment, care, and protection of GBV victims. Because again, that is what is going to make the difference between being a victim and a survivor. So we need sexual assault referral centers, we need shelters, we need uh, the provision of long-term like, um, you know, psychosocial support. And these things have to be done, not just by very tired, um, overworked and poorly funded um, civil society organizations, but they also have to be, be the responsibility of the state. Then we need um, education and orientation. So all our, for prevention, so all our education, um, you know, educational institutions, all the ways through which we can engage in popular education for people to know that sex, sexual and gender-based violence are things that we are not going to tolerate in our communities. Then we also need a process of community engagement. I spoke about community champions, our traditional rulers, religious leaders, and so on. They have a huge role to play in changing mindsets and in you know, setting an example for others uh, to follow. And then, of course, the whole issue of um, ensuring that you have a coordinating mechanism, as I described earlier, you know, the GBB management committee, every state should have the equivalent whereby civil society organizations can interface with different government agencies for everyone to tackle this problem from the angle that they can. But um, again, as I say over and over again, every single one of us needs to pick a corner in this debate and hold on to that corner and fight it, whether it's as parents, as policymakers, as um, academics, as writers, as filmmakers, as artists, or in any capacity we can, all of us have a role to play in all these issues I've spoken about. And to talk about the consensus that Professor Falola spoke about early, uh, early on, we need a consensus, a national consensus, that our country will not become a place where no woman or girl is free from sexual and gender-based violence. Yeah, I, now let's, let me take you to an interesting bit. I mean, part of the patriarchy is, uh, especially in the political arena, is uh, that the wife of a governor, the president, or any elective is not supposed to have a voice. And yet you have a voice, a strong one at that. Can you see your insights or some of the things you experienced in equity as a result of your, of, of, of your having a voice as the wife of a political leader? I mean, people will say, Anuru Enle kind of, uh, <laughs> can, you, can you share insights with us? Hmm. Well, that would happen. You can't expect um, that not to happen. But what my experience has been is that while there are people who um, would be very cautious of me and treat me with suspicion and not be very happy that I do have this voice, I like to believe that um, quite a number of people appreciate it. And I listen to what the women in particular say. And um, to a large extent, the men as well, when I go around our communities in Ikiti, and there's a song that the women sing in our local communities. Some of them will probably be online now. It's a Yoruba song, and uh, the transition of it is, if not for Erelu, we women would have suffered in Ikiti. And um, there's the um, saying in Ekiti that ah, if you touch your wife and you look here, you're in trouble. So there are those who appreciate the fact that um, I do have a voice and I'm appreciative of that. And as I said earlier, this is a platform that has a specific time frame. This is a voice I have always had and it is a voice I will continue to have. I've just decided to use the voice deliberately and again, with the support of my husband, because we are um, ideological soulmates, we, um, you know, I've said to use my voice deliberately in this position for this period of time, because I know that a lot can be done with it. And then, you know, at the end of the day, I hope that the people themselves will continue to own these issues. Because I keep telling them, yes, Irelu has fought for these laws, Irelu has pushed for these things, but they are for you, they are not for me. 
So I, I just hope that uh, that message continues to sink in. So do you have any political aspiration of yourself you contesting to be president of Nigeria? <laughs> Not for myself. Thank you. Thank you very much for your final question, which is pungent. She didn't answer it, which is okay. Uh, hey, prof, I said not for myself. <laughs> I didn't say I did not have. I just said not for myself. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, and we thank you. I think the voice is very well defined. This is the answer I will give. Because if you divide, define a voice, in relation to the progress of your society and to the cluster, the, the women cluster that she's identified, you are not at the center, one could argue of competitive politics of sharing and distribution, but the people at the grassroots are able to relate to that kind of um, passion. So thank you for the passion and thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, when this is over, there will be a series of analysis. I will write many of them, but I also employ you to, to write your analysis of the great interview uh, in newspaper. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mohamed Ruma, University of Abuja, join us. We are very grateful. Uh, that you're able to join us. Now, I want to move on to the final uh, person to interview her. In all our programs, we look for youth voice. We normally draw them from universities, but this time around we decided, why don't we try high school? We don't pick them randomly we picked them through a competition. And the person we emerged uh, is um, a high school student from um, Babcock, Babcock Academy at Belkuta. She's in SS2 um, and she's, she spent a junior secondary school in Babcock University High School. And she attended great group of schools she likes to swim she uh, uh, we thank god that our own ambition was not truncated um and um she she has written uh, a small book swimming in the midst of crocodiles uh, and she's embarking on another book of her own talking about women and impediments to success women and impediments to success. Uh, so, um, Idani Loju Ogo Olua, shorten them, Idani Loju, please post your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this opportunity granted unto me. I have to say it is a very, very rare experience which I can go through. My first question will be on your law of rape. Um, as Professor Falala has said, I'm working on a book project which talks about impediments to success on topics such as poverty, rape, death of parents, and gender discrimination, which throughout this course of these interviews, I figured out is one of your passions. My first question is about your law of rape. How well do you think the law is is implemented and how does it affect young teenage girls in my generation? Thank you, Idani Loju. It's so nice to be having this conversation with you. Now, as I said earlier, when I was talking to Mr. Shegum Adini, we have um, a gender-based violence law in the state and we implement it through the uh, state and gender-based violence management committee which addresses issues such as uh, survivors having access to justice 
which addresses um, the need for treatment camp protection. And in that area, we have a sexual assault referral center that we established last year. And we also have a large transit home and vocational center, which, is, which serves as a shelter for women and children in distress. Again, as part of uh, treatment camp protection, we have a gender-based violence survivors fund, which enables us to provide uh, resources for women who want to rebuild their lives after years of violence and so on. And then we are interested in education and um, or reorientation for prevention. We do a lot of uh, work using radio and, and social media, which is where we know we find a, young, a lot of young people. And we also do a lot of uh, work with communities going around talking to parents um, in particular about the need for them to keep an eye on their children, particularly uh, their uh, female children, to listen to them if they have concerns and to ensure that they minimize the vulnerabilities of these girls who would be predators around them. Because one of the things we know is that young girls are exposed to various um, you know, um, problems right from the time they leave home, from the Okada rider who takes them uh, from their homes to the gatesman at the school to uh, you know, male teachers and so on. And then of course, we are very concerned about the issue of uh, security in schools. So we've been going around schools in Ekiti State. The Ministry of Education in Ekiti State has done a lot of work around that, trying to address the issue of security in schools. Something that may to implement the GBV uh, laws and how it concerns uh, young girls such as yourself is that on the 15th of June, the Ministry of Education, Science and Technology launched a gender-based violence um, policy. And uh, in this policy, we have what we believe are probably the first set of um, you know, uh, school-related GBV directives in the country. Uh, from the Ministry of Education to all secondary schools in the city. And they address some of the problems that students, parents, and even teachers have um, shared with us um, in terms of what we need to do to protect uh, children in school. So these directives cover things, uh, for example, to include the issue of uh, male teachers, um, asking female students to come and see them at home to cook for them and clean for them, the issue of um, access to toilet facilities, the issue of um, ensuring that parents register whoever is bringing their children to school with the school authorities. Don't just call random Okada riders or taxi drivers to bring your child to school and so on. So essentially, uh, we believe that as young girls, you are entitled to an education. It's a right, it's not a privilege. You are enti entitled to give your lives free or fair. And if anything, should happen to you, someone should take responsibility for it because you are future and we need to do whatever we can to protect you and give you opportunities. I have to say it is the state is a very lucky state having you and your husband as their leaders and enjoying all these opportunities which some states don't get to have. My next question will be about girls in my generation. When you look around, we found most we find out most teenage girls have a lot of dependency and unnecessary obsession on boys and social media in, in order to increase their self-worth. Ma, please, what advice can you give to those teenage girls to have a higher self-confidence and self-esteem? <laughs> well, you heard me talking about patriarchy earlier. You are not too young to learn about what patriarchy is and how it affects your life. And patriarchy tells girls and women so many lies. And some of the lies patriarchy tells you, right from when you're a young girl is, you will never be enough. You will never be pretty enough. You will never be slim enough. You will never be fashionable enough. You will never be cool enough. So you need to know that you will always be enough. Your, we hope that your parents will teach you and uh, you will be such, you are such a wonderful role model for other girls like you. Idaniloju, you have a lot of confidence and I'm sure your parents are extremely proud of you. 
and so Thank are we all. Uh, so are we all as well. So young girls, you need to be able to grow up with um, as much self-esteem and confidence as possible. I was brought up by a father who thought the world of me, a father who believed that there was nothing I couldn't accomplish. Um, there are, um, I have a sister and a brother, so there are three, um, my parents have three children. And my father would tell anyone prepared to listen that my daughters are worth more to me than 10 sons. And so growing up with a father like that, who felt that I could own the world, why would I then come across a boy? Why would I then, sorry, allow a boy to treat me like dirt? Why would I, uh, you know, find myself, you know, uh, with a husband who does not value me? And so you need to hold on to who you are. You are beautiful. Stand in front of your mirror every morning, or if you don't have the time every night. Stand in front of him and tell your and tell your reflection of yourself, I am beautiful. I am valuable. I will be great. Repeat it after me. I am beautiful. I am beautiful. Mm -hmm. I am beautiful. I am valuable. I am valuable. I will be great. I must be great. That is a very good, good advice, Ma. During this course of the interview, we found out that you are a very, very passionate human rights activist. Can you tell us what inspires you to be such a great human rights advocate? A lot of things inspired me, but I will keep it brief. I think essentially, because I felt growing up that it's important for women to have choices. I grew up seeing a lot of injustice around me, even though I was fortunate, fortunate enough to have been brought up by loving parents who gave me you know, all the things that I needed. I still saw a lot of things around me, uh, my aunts, neighbors, and so on, who will go through one hardship or the other. And whenever I asked, why is this thing happening to this auntie? Why has this auntie been beaten by her husband this way? Why has this auntie been dispossessed of all her property because her husband died? And then I'll be told, oh, well, that's how things are for women. Yeah, we women don't have a choice. And so that bothered me. As I believe I've gone through life insisting that women must have choices. Women must have healthy, informed choices so that we can have control over our lives. And that is essentially what has informed a lot of the work that uh, I have been doing for most of my life, whether it's as a nonprofit person or a writer or um, you know, a theorist or as a politician. Women and girls must have choices to be able to live lives of dignity and respect. I have to say your experiences, which led you to be this kind of person has really empowered a lot of people. My next question will be, um, why, what do you consider the constraints women face and um, how can we increase their voices in an African setting on the gender equalities, on um, promoting their rights in politics? Well, I think, um, as I said earlier, it's important for women to have a voice. There are two things that have always been important to me. One of them is the issue of voice. And when I talk about voice, I talk about the ability to be able to speak up for yourself, the ability to be able to say certain things, the ability to be able to write as you do, that's, that's using your voice. And the other issue is space space to be able to articulate these issues, space to be able to do your writing, your reflection, your theorizing, and so on. And if women and girls do not have a voice, if we do not have space, then our lives are going to be one struggle after the other. And so um, one of the things I would encourage you to do is to keep using your voice and keep taking up space. If you take out space, then you're able to exercise leadership skills. And as you um, grow older, there are certain things that you'll be able to 
continue to do because you've had that experience, you've had that opportunity from an early age. Once you've grown up from a young age, having the self-esteem and self-confidence and the tools to be, able to, do, to be able to do a lot of these things, it's going to be hard for someone to tell you that there's something you can do, something you've been doing since you were 14 or 15 years old. So keep doing what you're doing now. Keep studying, keep writing, keep learning, and all these other things will continue to fall um, into place for you. You people, young girls like you are the reason why people like me keep doing this work. Hmm? Yes, ma. Ma, from your experiences, why do you think it's crucial to empower women, young women and girls to be engaged in decision making? And how do you think it can be achieved for teenage girls? I thought I just answered that question. Hmm? Ma, you did. I know you. No, you actually did, but like so there's a difference between making your voice known and trying to make your uh, there's a difference between trying to make your voice known and like having the real power to actually make your voice known first of all you start from making your voice known you start from um, learning as much as you can because you can't talk about anything you there have to be a range of issues that appeal to you that you are passionate about. So pick a number of areas that are important to you. Um, you know whether it's um, about the environment, whether it's about um, gender-based violence, education of girls. There must be a couple of issues that um, you are deeply concerned about and that you want to be an advocate um, on. And then you would um when you have this um uh, in place you would have certain leadership opportunities and people will recognize that you are able um to make a difference and they'll call on you to give speeches or you know serve as a role model to others now when you use these opportunities well from a young age as you go as you grow older it then gets easier for you to engage in other things like the mainstream political process for example if you've been a prefect in your school you've had an experience of leadership. So that makes it easier for you to put yourself forward later on for you to take on positions of responsibility. But as you take on these positions, you also know, as I said earlier, that to whom much is given, much is expected. You have to continue to learn. You have to continue to work well with people around you, have a good relationship with people around you, because then people see you as a role model and you can't afford to let people down. All these things are critical leadership tools that you will find useful later on in life. Thank you very much, Idani Loju. We, we are very grateful. You've asked important questions. Uh, I apologize for stopping you in the interest of time and to give um, some members of our audience uh, uh, to make them participatory. Thank you very much. You are beautiful, you are valuable, and you are going to be very successful. Uh, I love those mantra. Uh, as, um, in, as that conversation was going on, another vice chancellor joined us, the fifth one in the program, Professor Labo de Kukwola of Oshun State University. And another writer also joined us, Professor Femi Oshofeso, who turned 75 last week. Thank you for joining us. So we are going to be very busy in July. We have three people to interview. On July 11, we will focus on women in politics. And we are bringing a cluster of women and I would um, yield my space as a moderator. Then the president in waiting for the, a new country, an African country that they are struggling to declare Abyssinia, their president in exile will be uh, our guest. And on July 25, uh, His Majesty, uh, the Oshimawe of Undo uh, will be our guest as we broaden uh, the base to various constituencies. Thank you. Now, we now want the members of the audience 
to ask questions. Some have sent questions ahead of time. Obina will do a ballot and choose two, but the emphasis will be on those who are here. Uh, um, and I apologize um, for not being able to take many questions that have been sent ahead. Um, please also, if the ambassador to Brazil can come on the video, and at this time we can also allow His Excellency, uh, the governor, to also uh, show his face. I will allow him to ask one question. To be alone, to be alone, please. Introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you. My name is Toby Alunge. I have been a teacher for 14 years before I left uh, fatherland to my motherland. And quickly, I was going to ask my question based on education for girls as it relates to gender balance. Earlier, our excellency talked about why our boys are becoming engineers and doctors. We should be aware that we should be conscious that they don't end up being this breast seller. But Ma, I also want to make this point that have we thought it through that while we are trying to make them be you know, a breast seller, we might be having teenagers who are going to be having children that does not have or whose father did not claim or who has uh, issues with parenting. Why I say this is that in my course of being a class teacher, each year since the issue of girls can further their education, even while pregnant has begun, where I teach, we have children who are pregnant every year when we are having senior school certificate examinations. They come to classes sleeping, and we as teachers and parents, we are not allowed to detect pregnancy until they have a big belay or when they have a big uh uh we, they tell on the ministry that you are not doctors and nurses so you should not be able to identify a student who is pregnant so we wait three four five months six months when they now have when it's become obvious so during this process teaching and learning activity is quite challenging in southwest where should uh, female has a larger percentage in classes so when I'm teaching a class of 40 with 25 being children, being, being girls, and about six, seven of them are already pregnant, sleeping, and randomly, I could not uh, use my playway method to bring them on board. So we have the challenge that if care is not taken, at SS1, they might have a child, go back and come back in SS3 and have another one. And they have so-called husband, who happens to be an Okada rider might not take responsibility. And even when they are, they have a child in the course, they still have more. They don't stop in one. They still have because some, as I said, Yoruba people, we want our children to have uh, uh, to be married. So they send them to their husband's house. You are pregnant. You have a child. You are married. Go to him. And in the course, they begin to regenerate while they still come to school to further their education. So I want to ask what policy can we put in place so that while we are trying to balance the education for girls, we don't end up having teenagers who have multiple child and parenting becomes an issue in the future. And we still have to cope with these challenges over time in our society. Thank you. Prof, do you want me to respond to each question as it's asked, or do you want me to um, no, it has to be person wait by for person. others? No, person by person. OK. So thank you, Mr. Alunge. I would like to plead with you, sir, for you to try and be a bit more compassionate and show more empathy. As I said uh, during my um, you know, discussion, these girls do not impregnate themselves. And these measures we are talking about are not measures that we are taking in isolation of a number of other things. 
we also need to look at the role that sex education plays. Believe it or not, a lot of these young girls don't know that much about their body. One of the girls who ended up in our care, pregnant, when we asked her, what happened to you? She was 14. You know, who did this to what happened to you? She said, uh, the brother said that she would not get pregnant and that um, he, she would only get pregnant if he slept with her 10 times and that he would not sleep with her 10 times, he'd only sleep with her two or three times. And so she was, surprised, she was surprised when she found herself pregnant. Why would she not find herself pregnant when she doesn't know that much about her body? Or she, um, you know, sex education is either not taught at all in our schools or is taught very reluctantly. This is a community effort. You as a teacher and um, as a parent, we need to try and listen more to what these young girls are saying. We need to look at the environment that these young girls live in. Yes, granted, it's not desirable that we have our daughters pregnant in school when they are supposed to be sitting for exams, but that's the hand we are dealt with. And if we do not make a decision that is in the interest of uh, the future of these girls, we are going to end up, as I said earlier, with the boys turning out to be engineers and the girls selling bread on the streets. Thank you. Rachel Fagboy, Rachel. Reach out. Unmute. Um, good evening, Excellency. I'm super, super happy to be here. And I'm from Ekiti State. So I am very happy at the good work you're doing. Uh, more grace to your elbow. My name is Rachel Fagoyo. I'm a graduate assistant at um, Glorious Vision University in Oguaedo State. So I just want to ask, you know, for young girls like us that are passionate about, you know, girls' education, you know, catering for um, the young girls, you know, and issues that um, are accruing to them, how should we, you know, how should we make our voice heard even without with the limited resources we have? You know, currently I'm working on a project to give out a thousand sanitary pad to local girls here in Ogwa. And then one of the one of the major challenges I have right now would be finances. But then we're looking at how to get you know the general public you know to to finance this project. But some persons will be like, oh why are you just making it for the girls? Boys to make um you know have issues and several things. So how do you encourage you know young girls out there to keep pushing you know even for the young girls? Thank you very much, um, Vishal. It's uh, so nice to hear from you. And I'm excited that you are working with other young women to support uh, the issue of menstrual hygiene products. You, see, you young yeah. women, you have something that we did not have when we were your age, when um, we were doing all this work in the feminist movement. You have technology. The first time I uh, sent an email was 1995 when we were registering for the Beijing conference. And a lot of us got, and I was in London at the time, it had nothing to do with whether I was in, a, you know, in Nigeria or something. We, I was in London and a lot of us did, had never used email. And that was the only way we could register for the Beijing conference, either the NGO forum or the official conference. So we had to get email accounts and, uh, you know, those old, ones that uh, Greenet that used to give this data on time. And <laughs> so but today, you have these powerful uh, tools that you can use to organize yourself, that you can use to um, uh, for advocacy, for fundraising, for raising awareness. So I know that social media is also used for other terrible things. And this is something that um, it's so that you have that can be that can be deployed into a very strong um you know way of you know gathering people together passing the message across and uh, building the uh, you know financial resources and the social capital you capital you need to get your work done so keep up good work thank you very much ma thank you um chido numa please 
Chido. Yes, please go ahead. All right. Thank you, Prof. Uh, good evening, uh, Your Excellency. It's nice to see you. Good evening, my dear brother. Long time. Uh, how are you? No, I, I've known you. I've been following your work for more than two decades. And your, your work straddles both theory and practice. I, I'll focus a little on the theory aspect of it. Uh, my interest is uh, in feminism vis-a-vis -vis the intersection between feminism and identity politics, particularly in a country like, uh, like Nigeria. Uh, we know patriarchy, and this is my personal opinion, patriarchy and all the problems associated with gender-based violence are to, great, to a great extent rooted in religion, culture, tradition, and so on. Uh, do you see any problem when you're looking at uh, feminism vis-a-vis -vis identity politics in Nigeria, or are there any, if, if there are any challenges that you think are inherent and how do we deal with these challenges? Thank you very much. Challenges in what? Yeah, challenges. So you, you talk about patriarchy, you talk about gender-based violence and right feminists and women's rights activists. How do we relate that to uh, our so-called what our tradition and culture and religion offers us in a country like Nigeria. Uh, how, how do we deal with uh, having to these positive aspects of feminism vis-a-vis -vis what we are dealt with or given, by, say, by religion, tradition, and so on in a country like ours? Yes, well, it's part of what I meant earlier by looking at some of the issues that African women have been concerned about over time. Now, if we agree that we cannot have an understanding of um, feminism or you know, patriarchal oppression outside of the historical realities that we live with or that we've grown up with, then we should also understand um, where we as feminists are coming from when we say we understand these realities, we accept them because we share that history. However, we want a new way of being together. So my being a good Nigerian, my wanting a one Nigeria or good governance in Nigeria or a community that respects its culture and its um, norms and values should not be inconsistent with my demands um, as a feminist for my personhood to be respected. And if um, you know, we continue to have these um, engagements, I keep setting feminists up against um, those who believe, um, you know, that because people keep saying that you know you cannot be um, a good uh, Nigerian or you cannot be a true citizen of the country if you do not believe that there are you know certain aspects of our cultures. Um, if you believe that there are aspects of our cultures that need to be done away with. And we think that that thinking has no place in this day and age. Now, the whole, uh, if you think back to the times when African women played a key role in nation building, in many parts of the continent, we, we picked up arms, we fought at frontline, front line, um, you know, um, frontline struggles and so on, only for the nation state to then to not be created outside of our existence as women. And what I mean by that is, until constitution started being revised recently over the past 20 years, there are many constitutions in Africa that wrote women out of the constitution as um, independent beings. There are many of us who are not able to transfer our citizenship as citizens of our countries to other people. So if uh, a Nigerian woman marries a foreigner, she can't transfer her citizenship. But a Nigerian man can transfer his citizenship to a foreigner, which means the citizenship of many Nigerian women and the same happened across the continent is in question. So essentially what we are saying is we have to have debates that enable us build communities and build our nations, taking into consideration the fact that we need to live our lives um, you know, with dignity and respect and 
talking about consensus on a number of issues. We, we as Afri Nigerian feminists, for example, we believe that we cannot have a country without peace and security where everyone uh, can go about their um, you know, businesses or their endeavors in peace. So peace and security is an absolute must. We also need to address the issue of um, you know, the feminization of poverty and livelihoods. The more dire our economic situation gets in the country, especially now uh, that we, we are dealing with post-COVID um, issues, the more poor choices women are going to be forced to make. And that is going to have a bearing on our moral and social fabric in the society. And a lot of people are now saying that's one of the reasons why young you know, people are up to one thing or the other, and there's nothing their parents can do because they're the ones feeding their parents. Then there's also the issue of access to education, which we've been talking about, and um, the fact that we have up to 15 million uh, Nigerian children out on the streets, and 60% of those 15 million children are girls. Granted, we have the cases with insurgency in the north, that's why a lot of them are out of school. But for those of us in the southern part of the country, the girls are out of school because of sexual exploitation and poverty. And so a feminist analysis enables us to address all these core issues and priorities for us to reach a consensus, whether we want to call ourselves feminists or not. If we agree as a country that we need to address these issues with whatever spaces we, ha we have via legislation, their policies or you know uh, through writing and uh, like you my dear brother then we all need to get on the same page to make our societies better because i am i have always believed that the theorizing that we do has to at the end of the day produce um so workable solutions for our communities without so those solutions we are going nowhere thank you very much I want to now call on Her Excellency, my good friend, Professor Benabusia, to uh, make comments or ask questions. Uh, before she got here, I started this conversation by mentioning you. And you may have forgotten when I was visiting you at Rutgers, you were speaking so highly of her I'm proposing a nomination for an honorary doctorate at Rutgers. And <laughs> <laughs> I did, I tried. <laughs> I do think so highly of her, you know. She, she always calls me big sister, but I have to confess, she is clearly one of those younger sisters who has transformed the old women. I have learned so much from her. Um, and but I want to begin my friends by apologizing you I've been visually absent for two reasons one the connection is a little unstable and it works better when the visuality is not off but I must confess as you know I am in Brasilia and I am currently hosting your ambassador and his wife <laughs> they are new they they arrived while I was still in Ghana and they came to visit me today and I didn't you know as as they um this was a surprise to them that's why my computer's in a different place because I've been carrying the computer around to um where we are sitting um but I you know I wanted to the 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 connection was unstable so that's why I was not visible but I I made myself visible just to say just to apologize for my half presence, but also to, to, to pick up on something um, my dear sister said a minute ago, because it touches on one of the things that I'm always trying to stress about our work as feminists. And that is the ways in which our work the challenge of our work is 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 what i call unraveling the normative you see we we live lives in a certain way and assume so much or don't question so much i mean the question of citizenship is a very big one which very very few people um think about 
but in most of our constitutions, the ideal citizen is male. The way they're written, the things they look about and so on. And just simple things like, you know, who can pass on citizenship and who can't. I mean, I, and this isn't just, this isn't just Africans, you know, an, a woman who has, in many countries, a woman who has a child away from her own home to a man to whom she's not married will find herself, her child stateless. You know, like a, an English woman who gets pregnant with a Spanish lover in Spain. If, if the country does not have soil, that is, not all countries are you a citizen automatically if you're born there. Spain is one of those. But if the man is not married to you, he's not passing his citizenship onto your child, and you suddenly find in the middle of your pregnancy that you are, your child is stateless, you know, things like that. It, it's like um, every man who has a child, the child is his and can pass on his citizenship, but women cannot make those assumptions. We have to think, where are we having our baby? Um, do we have to be married to the man or not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and, and those, the kinds of things that people don't think about, the kinds of assumptions that people make about what it means to be a woman and the implications. I mean, one of the big things, for example, that we've struggled with in Ghana a lot is, is widowhood rights. The, the, in many countries, the fault lines lie between our traditional ideas of, of inheritance and widowhood rights and the notions of the state. And they very often come into conflict and there are many classic cases of that. So it's those kinds of things that, um, you know, the kinds of things, we, what, what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a girl, the assumptions that are made about the availability of women's bodies in certain situations, the assumptions that are made about um, who gets punished and who gets not for the same kinds of so-called social transgressions. You know, I've yet to come across uh, a school anywhere in the world where if a young man gets a woman pregnant, he's the one kicked out of school, <laughs> you know, and things like that. So, so it was just, I was, you know, it's those kinds of things that are considered normative that we have to push against because it's like, you know, what is air? It's the things we take for granted that we don't question until they fall apart on us. And, um, and for me, the kind of work that Erelu is doing is the kind of work that pushes us, even those of us who think we've got it together, um, that pushes us all the time to look at the boundaries. What are the boundaries and what are the implications and the assumptions of these boundaries? You know, my professional introduction was through the African Women's Development Fund. And the way that fund was set up, the, the questions that were asked in setting up that office, how do we tell our stories? Who tells our stories? I don't know if any of you have ever seen AWDF publications, but simple things like the the publication quality, the quality of those publications is not accidental. It has to do with changing a narrative. So it's not only the content of what is published, but how it's presented is part of changing the narrative. But no, very few people think about the cumulative effects of the difference between the publications in terms of physically beautiful and ones where the same information, information is given, but the production qualities are not the same. And when you spend years with women who think about all those kinds of details, it opens your eyes to what I call the significance of the ordinary. 
And I think that's the most important thing we need to learn to look at is the significance of the ordinary. Mm. Thank you so much. I could see the Nigerian ambassador behind your back. <laughs> we can greet them. Yes, yeah, sorry. Let's say hello to Thank them. Thank you so much, Sister <laughs> B. Yes, okay. It's so good to see you. Here we, here we are. Okay. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. We're happy to hear this. Uh, very broad uh, and extensive uh, discussion on a topic of a very good of interest. I am just like uh, Professor was saying, our ambassador, uh, we came in while this thing has already been on for some more time. So we couldn't, we were not here when it started. So we didn't know why it started really. But we are very happy to hear that you are making something to do with the womanhood. Women, yes. And uh, <laughs> it's going to affect or oh, improve the livelihoods of women across oh. the continent, um, across the world. So uh, I think I think this is a very uh, good opportunity for us to show our faces and congratulate you for this effort and hope that whatever resolution uh, is achieved, whatever your resolutions you reach out, we hope we'll be able to uh, partake in implementing them to the, for the good of our people. I can guarantee you for sure that we will continue to support women. They are our fathers, they are our mothers, I mean, they are, mothers, they are mm. our sisters. They are our, so we are together with them. And anywhere they are, we will have to give them a maximum support. That's why I'm always together with my wife. <laughs> right now to see her also. So thank you so much again. And please do not forget that uh, the proportion of men across Nigeria is already much higher than men. And the middle age, over 40% are youth, aged between 18 to 25, 30, so are the youth. And that is the critical age. We need to do something about the future of Nigeria, the whole the future of Nigeria. Right now, a lot of things can be improved. If such kind of conferences come up with solutions on how to address this particular group of um, uh, young ladies that are coming up, uh, lots of things are going the same part, uh, falling apart. Uh, the traditional ways of raising the children, the traditional ways of looking at them and so forth, uh, impacting on their lives. And of course, that is the consequences of what will also eventually happen on all Nigerians, since um, uh, women occupy a central role uh, in the family. So I hope that this, this discussion will center on these issues and prioritize where we can start and where we can continue. And I'm also, lastly, very um, welcome this fund, uh, African Women Development Fund, or whatever you call it. I can just overheard it from uh, Her Excellency now. Uh, I wish to know how it is, uh, how they source their funds, how they administrate it and all that. Later, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> I'll speak with the ambassador and find out. If there are any contributions, we'll be making to make a contribution. Thank you so much. Thank you, and um, oh, for sorry, the name. Please. The name is uh, Pro Professor Mohammed Ahmed Makarafi, uh, the Nigerian ambassador to Brazil, in Brazilia. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I recommend that Our Excellency gives you Banku, grilled tilapia, and shito. If not, she can make you jollof rice. Uh, very, no, very, as for the jollof rice wars, I will not enter. No, no, I'll serve the <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, Your Excellency. Yeah, thank you. Now we can release you, but she has to answer your question. Please, Irelu, you have to answer our questions or you can treat them as comments. Um, Prof didn't ask a question, she made comments. Okay. But, <laughs> but just to say that um, um, Auntie Abby has been a big sister and friend of mine for many years now, a great sister, mentor and friend. She claims that I mentor her too, that's absolutely fine. Thank you. And one of the um, very powerful lessons I have learned
from Sister Abby, going back to the issue of the rapper, is the importance of kindness. And we keep, and I think, you know, that's a particular example of the significance of the ordinary. And I'd like to share um, a story that uh, she's tired, she's probably tired of me telling it. And I've mentioned it in uh, my memoirs, speaking above a whisper. In the year 2000, uh, when we had the uh, formal launch of the African Women's Development Fund uh, in New York, we had it at the UN uh, Millennium Plaza. And um, the day, of course, was spent putting you know, things into place at the last minute. And then I brought out the suit I was going to wear that evening, a really lovely, sharp, heavy Bernard suit. And I then discovered that a button was missing on the suit and there was no spare button and if i wanted to wear that suit i would have to look for other buttons to um you know to put on the suit i'd have to take off the four buttons on the suit and um you know change them and so i managed to get the buttons but then there was an issue of now sitting down to sew on the buttons and so that's the point at which um, Sister B came in. And she said, okay, Mr. are you all set for this evening? I said, yes. She said, is there anything I can do? I said, not really. I said, I just want to sit down now and try and, you know, sew on these buttons. And she said, oh, I'll do those. And she took the needle and thread. This professor of literature at Rutgers University, my senior by how many years, my big auntie took this needle and thread and sat down and sewed on the buttons for me. Now, I know that she probably forgot that she'd done that, but I have never forgotten. And I use that as um, you know, a powerful uh, metaphor for what it means to be kind, to show compassion, and to extend your wrapper. It doesn't really matter, uh, you know, uh, what we make of ourselves in this world. It's good for us to be very accomplished people. But the most significant thing we can do is to be remembered as decent human beings. And I think that is something that we need to continue to, in all the difficulties we have faced right now as a community and as a nation or nations, we need to try and keep passing on that message, the importance of being kind so that we our communities do not continue to collapse around us. Thank you very so much. So thank you, Sister Abby. I love you. And please, uh, Erelu, remind Sister Abby that she holds me a collected essays, which I want to publish. We've been on this for years. So please, now, now that you have less time, more time as ambassador, you have more time now, please put these essays together so we can publish them. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Amidu Sani, Vice Chancellor, Fountain University, your turn. Professor Sunny. Yes, am I on now? Good yes, evening, uh, Professor Fonola, and uh, good evening, our great uh, guest today, uh, Her Excellency Irelu. Well, I just have some few comments. Number one, this issue of drug and crime is becoming more uh, rampant now among the girls, ch 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 so to say. And of course, you are probably aware of what the recent happenings uh, in, in the Nigerian context now. University students or secondary student, student indulging in drug and ultimately in crime. And I think your advocacy should cast its net wider now to accommodate this one. Number two, well, these cultural practices, which are more or less uh, affecting widowhood, affecting inheritance, whatever, in certain parts of the country. I think you also need to do more advocacy now, rather than uh, working towards any constitutional amendment. Of course, it is the locals, the locals or the honorable, or the, uh, the locals uh, the, 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 that will be able to sort of uh, work hard to ensure that the right of the female is uh, actually uh, guaranteed and protected. So this is another thing that I think you need to work on. The third one, uh, I know His Excellency JKF and Babakar uh, Mama and others, I knew you, in the 80s and 90s were very, very active voices. But I think in the Nigerian context of today, uh, the political space is more of a nocturnal uh, space. I'm 
not sure uh, any woman or any, I know, you know, our politicians in Nigeria here, and perhaps another class, do most, most of their deliberations in at night. So how do you think the women can actually key into this one without losing their home front? And of course, you know that the numerical strength of the women in Nigeria actually gives them the opportunity to actually overturn the dominant, the, the patriarchy against which uh, your feminist group has uh, often uh, campaigned. So how do you think can translate this numerical power into actual political power within the Nigerian context? And these are just my own uh, observation. But of course, the issue of this uh, sex for grade or grade for sex something. And I think it's something that has to do more with greater advocacy and more punitive measures against both the, 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 the man or woman and vice versa. We've also talked about uh, electorals uh, sort of uh, harassing uh, women. We want to talk of uh, women electorals also harassing younger boys. And it's, it's a very important thing. So these are just my submissions and thank you very much. I regard to JKF. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much, um, Professor Sonny. On the issue of drug abuse, and that's um, a very important issue. A lot of us are, are, are absolutely concerned about it. Yesterday was the International uh, Day for uh, Drug uh, Abuse and Awareness. And many civil society organizations, women's rights organizations, as well as first ladies around the country um, have been running programs um, on the issue. On Tuesday, for example, the Nigeria Governors Wise Forum, we have a webinar with the entertainment industry in Nigeria, looking at the connections between drug abuse and uh, gender-based violence. So it's an issue that we are definitely um, concerned about and uh, all hands need to be on deck around it. On the issue of harmful traditional practices, and you mentioned constitutional amendments, we, I never said that we were pushing for constitutional amendments to address the issue of harmful traditional practices. Um, when I was talking about constitutional amendments, I was talking about it in relation to um, putting special mechanisms or special measures in place to um, ensure that we have more, it could be temporary special measures, but measures to ensure that we have more women in um, politics. I was talking about affirmative action and quotas, and that can be done either via constitutional amendments, via the uh, amending um, the electoral laws, or via um, us having it embedded in the gender and equal opportunities law. Now we have the violence against persons prohibition law, the child rights law, and um, those are laws, and then we have the national gender policy. Those are instruments that are meant to be domesticated at state level. And I believe that is what you mean by having local communities to address these issues. When the governors, the Nigerian Governors Forum declared the state of emergency against gender-based violence in June 20, on June 10, 2020, only 14 states in Nigeria had domesticated the violence against persons prohibition act. As of today, um, June 27. Uh, 2021, there are 27 states in Nigeria who have domesticated the VAP Act. And we know that more are still going to do so before the end of the year, because they're still at, uh, some of them are in various stages, um, you know, in the different states, in the state houses of assembly. So those, um, you know, laws are very important for us at sub-national level and community level to ensure that we make a difference. Talking about political space being mostly a nocturnal space and um, space that um, locks women um, out of it, that has been the norm. That has been the practice and is one of the reasons why uh, we continue to see um, um, you know, comparatively smaller numbers of women um, in political participation. Having said that, there are things that can be done there are things that we have been pushing for. We have been pushing, for example, for there to be more women in the leadership of political parties. Women shouldn't just be content with being the welfare officers of these um, you know, political parties or being the woman, just the woman leaders. The role of the woman leader is extremely important. But we also need women to be chair, uh, 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 chairman of their parties or state chairs of their parties. We need them to be legal advisors. We need them to be treasurers. Those are very powerful positions in parties that can enable 
women have the bargaining um, power that they need for them to be able to um, you know, get um, recognition. There are many uh, stereotypes around women in politics. There are many assumptions that people make about women. It is true that politicians have this habit of meeting, you know, of meeting late and so on. And many women have had to uh, make sacrifices to be able to uh, keep up with these very um, you know, unsavory practices. But those are some of the ways in which the boys try and keep women out. And um, as women, we have learned to push back. And so there are many of us who are saying, even if you have the meetings to four in the morning, go there, be there. Ask your husband if he's supportive of you, ask him to accompany you. He doesn't need to sit in a, on the meeting. He can be in the waiting room or wait for you um, in the car. And we've had a lot of women do that. But we can't afford to continue to let all these um, man-made barriers continue to push women out of the political process. And then um, on the issue of sex for grades that you mentioned, yes, it is true. We, and uh, uh, Sheikh Wadini mentioned it in his book as well. We do have a small number of women who, who act as predators. And in our book, it really doesn't matter whether it is the male doing the, um, you know, um, committing these acts or whether it is, it is wrong. Our children, male or female, should not have to trade uh, sex for grades. It is wrong. And so that is why we need um, a zero tolerance culture against these issues. And we need institutions led by people such as yourselves to take this seriously. And we should not um, continue to say it is not only the girls who are affected, the boys are affected, or the men are affected. That does not solve the problem. The problem at hand is the vast majority, 98% are girls, and we can't afford for our girls to continue to um, be deprived of a decent ed education because they're evading um, you know, the, uh, the clutches of their teachers. Thank you. We'll be winding down, but before we do so, we received close to 100 questions. We did a ballot and we chose two. And um, Obina will read the two questions. Obina, please. Yes. Um, good evening, Ma. Once again, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you. Um, so the two questions, I, I have two questions that have been chosen or were submitted by the audience, and um, I'll, I'll try and get through them. So the first one is building on a lot of the things that you've already talked about and so the thing, in fact, in some things that you just talked about in the previous statement or in your previous answer, and some of the things that Daju um, mentioned, um, what is the one important piece of advice for women who are interested in taking up leadership roles in their communities, especially bearing in mind the sometimes hostile and frustrating environment and space that is Nigerian politics? Yes. Thank you, Obina. Well, my advice would be that, um, first of all, you need to take a close look at your context. What would work for you? What opportunities would you have where you are? Are your expectations realistic? You need to do something of a sort, you know, um, that tool that we use for strategic thinking and planning, look at your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats, and keep reviewing this on a regular basis. So for example, if you are based in Lagos, you live and work in Lagos, and you want to run for political office, where are you running? Are you running for office from Lagos? Are you running for office from the community you come from? For example, maybe you come from Ogu State, or you come from Anambra State. And if you decide that you want to go and run in an Ambra state, it's not enough to just come from an Ambra state. You have the kind of political capital that you need um, you know, to do it. So you need to assess your context. That's extremely important. And keep an eye on it on a continuous basis because your context might change. Second, you need to, and this is just talking to young, um, you know, young women generally, not just, not just those who want to go into leadership, or of course, it's very useful leadership advice. Try as much as possible to stay away from negative energy. I am amazed and alarmed at the quantum of negative energy 
that people generate these days and how content some people are to wallow in that negative energy back and forth, back and forth. I think um, if you want to go far in life as a leader, you need to immerse yourself in things that will get you places. Read, write, watch a good play, watch a good film, have good friends, but cut negative, minimize negative energy because that follows you wherever you go, like bad air, like rotten air. And I think uh, maybe the third piece of advice I, I will give, which came out of um, an essay I wrote last year uh, for my birthday. And a lot of young women keep referring to it up to now because I have this uh, network known as the Rapper Network. And there are over 3,700 women on that network. And they keep you know, debating some of the things I write about. So there was this essay I wrote last year about carrying and dropping bags. And one young woman asked me recently, can you explain that to me? Can you give me more information about what you meant, what you had in mind when you were writing this? And I, and I asked, okay, when you travel and you get a conveyor belt to pick up your bags, how do you know which bag is yours? And she said, I will know which bag is mine. I said, how do you know? She would say, I will know the color because of the labeling, because of the lock I would have put on it. I said, fine. So once you picked up your bag, why don't you pick up the bag that follows? She said, why would I do that? That's not my bag. Then I asked her, why do a lot of you go through life picking up bags that don't belong to you? If you want to be a leader, pick up your own bags, carry your own bags. Everything else is excess. It doesn't belong to you. Once again, uh, thank you very much. Extremely wise words. And so the second question is, is advice once again, uh, but this time not for women. So in your previous statements, you mentioned that although, although it's a system of patriarchy that might oppress women, that patriarch, that system is still made up of men, our brothers, our fathers, our sons, people that we interact with every day. So what role do men and boys play in the feminist effort? How can they help to bring about equity, in your opinion? Thank you. Thank you, Obina. Um, men and boys can do a lot of things. First of all, they need to acknowledge the kind of um, powers and privileges that patriarchy confers on them. And they need to understand the ways in which this affects the lives of women and girls. We need men to have a different understanding of what masculinity means and what it means and what it doesn't mean. And we need men who believe in the values of equity, fairness, um, you know, justice and so on, to be exemplars, to teach other men. Because we women are tired, at least I'm tired at my age of teaching men you know, what to do, what not to do. I think men should hear this from other men. Older men need to teach younger men. Younger men need to share with their peers about what it means to have a society that can truly clap with both hands. Men need to, especially the young men of this generation, you have so much going for you, right? And so I do, you shouldn't be making the same mistakes. You can have a truly great society if it is built on everyone being able to fulfill their full potential. Everyone um, pulling their weight, everyone taking their own share of the chores of raising children and so on. So that we can have a society that is uh, fully balanced and not one in which um, you know, um, a good you know, 50 to 55% of us feel that we um, are second class citizens right from the time we are born to the time that we die. So there's a lot you can do. Yeah. Yes. Thank you once again for your wise words, Your Excellency. Um, I'm, I believe that's all, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to thank Irelu for this interview, thank my great colleagues uh, who participated. I managed to steal some time. I took five minutes from um, Bamindele, took some five minutes from um, Idaju uh, so that we can allow this to go on. 
So we negotiated two hours, but we've gone above that by 50 minutes. So we are very grateful. I thank all of you. Uh, I wish you well, and I hope the, the answers will be of great value uh, in our education system. And part of the outcome that we've um, advocated, we will work on them, especially invigorating our classes, providing pocket books that others can use. We are very grateful. Uh, you can go and have your dinner. There's only one food in the kitchen state, pandemic. yam. It's for breakfast and lunch and dinner. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> but Prof, can I can I say something, please, sir, uh, before yeah. you round up? Yes, I yes. am committed to, if you'll be kind enough to send me the questions, I will be quite happy to answer the questions and send them back to you. And oh. then you can share at your convenience. I'll be quite happy to do it. I will do that. Thank you very much for the graciousness to also extend this time. Thank you. And then we look forward to seeing you uh, at our next event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Prof.